And here we go. We are excited to talk about tonight's event with Sarah Dykeman, author of Bicycling with Butterflies, my 10,201 mile, mile journey following the monarch migration. We're excited for a number of reasons. Personally, when I was young, I'd be the kid watching butterflies as opposed to pop flies while standing in the, out, in the outfield of baseball games. Hey, butterflies were a lot softer than landing on my head than baseballs were. Several decades later, when a butterfly flew between the spokes of my bicycle wheel untouched as I huffed up a steep mountain pass. While destroying my Tour de France dreams, I nearly tipped over in laughter and wonderment at these amazing creatures. In that time, my wife and I experienced the alternating stress and joy of watching monarch caterpillars go through their instars on nearby milkweed plants. While we also worried about the dramatic disappearance from overwintering sites at our neighboring Elwood Beach, as well as Pismo Beach. So when I read Sarah Dykeman's wonderful book, Bicycling with Butterflies, I was alternately alarmed and heartened. Alarmed because what is happening to the butterflies as they disappear from the earth. But then I was heartened by Sarah and her journey, the people she came across and the young people she influenced. While she journeyed 10,201 mi miles from Mexico to Canada and back again, to follow the monarch migration in the East. Sarah Dykeman is the founder of beyondabook.org, which fosters lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. She works in amphibian research and as an outdoor educator, guiding young people into nature so they can delight in its complicated brilliance. She hopes her own adventures, which include walking from Mexico to Canada, canoeing the Mississippi River from source to sea, and cycling over 80,000 miles across North and South America, including the Monarch Migration Trip, will empower young and old to dream big. So everyone, please welcome Sarah Dykeman. Hello. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and thanks for putting this together tonight. Um, I, as Michael said, my book is Bicycling with Butterflies, and I hope you can all help support me and the butterflies and Chaucer Books by, by buying a copy. The, the most frequent question I get during these events is, can I buy too many books? And the answer is no, don't worry. Buy a couple, buy them for the neighbor who thinks you're crazy for planting so much milkweed in your yard or the person that's like, why wait, why do you like to bike? Because I, I think my book will help explain that. And I hope I kind of explain that tonight too. Um, my, my goal today or tonight is to spend a, a little bit of time going over a, a little bit about the monarch butterfly for folks that don't know a whole lot about that. And then a little bit about bike touring and then tell some stories from the road, stories from the road. So I actually have a little presentation I put together and I'm going to configure that right now. And don't worry, it only takes me like five to 10 minutes to get this set up. But I'm bumped. That's a joke, but I, <laughs> I'm gonna stop telling jokes so I can concentrate. Oops. And we'll get the PowerPoint and we'll get my camera up there. All right. Um, so this is the monarch butterfly for folks that don't know. This is in fact a male monarch. You can tell because he has these black dots on his wings. Those are um, scent pouches. The, the, the monarch is one of many in a, a family with, that uses scent pouches, but the monarchs, the males don't actually use them all that much for, for finding mates. They're, they're kind of just left over. And he is currently nectaring on this beautiful swamp milkweed. And the monarch, um, spreads out all across North America. And this is the range. And I'm gonna actually make this map a little bigger to help everybody see. And don't worry if you can't read all the tiny print. The important thing to note is that there's four colors. And the yellow is where they spend the summer months. The green is where they spend the spring. And the fall is the orange color. And then the blue is winter. And you can tell there's a few spots that have blue. There's a, a, a few blue dots in Florida. Then we have the main overwintering grounds in central Mexico. This is in the state of Michoacan in the state of Mexico. 
And then we have, of course, monarchs on the coast of California. And you'll see that there's some arrows. The monarchs in California, they'll do um, a migration north and then back to the, to the winter range. And those are small arrows because it's not quite as big of a population. And I'm going to get into the, the current monarch, um, Western monarch numbers a little bit later. But for now, what's important to note is, is that I followed the Eastern monarchs. And the, the dividing line is the Rocky Mountains. And we often call this the Eastern monarch population. And then on, in California, we have the Western monarch population. But they're actually not distinct populations. There is overlap. There's no genetic difference between them that scientists have found so far. And in fact, we'll find that monarchs from the West will end up in the overwintering grounds. And so we suspect also that some from the wintering grounds prob probably fly to, to the West as well. So, so a, a little bit of, of a little science blah there, but that's the, the main bit about the range. And here's my route. So like I said, I followed the Eastern Monarchs. The red line is my bicycle route. That is a 10,201 mile line. It took me eight and a half months, averaging about 60 miles a day. I started at the overwintering grounds in central Mexico in, in the state of Michoacan. And I traveled north into Texas, all the way into Canada. I did a big loop through the, the Northeast before heading back south in November. So I started in March, ended in November, just like the monarchs do. And now I can get make my map a little smaller again. Hi. So uh, that was a little primer on the monarchs. Actually, let me go back. Wh one other really cool fact about the monarchs, the Eastern monarchs, is that the monarchs that I started my migration with are not the ones I ended with. So the other thing that would be great to, to let people know is that the, the route of the monarch is multi-generational. And yeah, and I'll, I'll do a little, I'll get, talk to you a little bit more. And if you have questions about the specifics of the science, go ahead and throw those in the question and answer as well. So a little brief primer on bicycle touring next. This is me on my trusty bike with some beautiful common milkweed in the background there. And you can see my bike is nothing special. And in fact, I made my bike from old used parts in 2013, just, it cost, I think my bike cost about $150 to, to make at the time. And what I love about this setup is, well, one, it's really comfortable, two, it's really durable, and three, I just don't have to stress about it. I can leave my bike in front of a gas station or a grocery store and, and not worry too much about someone stealing it. Also, I have on my bike these panniers, and the panniers are awesome because they let me carry a bunch of stuff. So the front ones are where I usually would put my sleeping pad, sleeping book, sleeping book, sleeping bag, uh, usually a book and my computer, my headlamp. And those are kind of the things that I really wanted to make sure stayed dry because you do not want to sleep in a wet sleeping bag. That's terrible. And then in the back, my, my panniers are actually old recycled kitty litter buckets. And the the great thing about the kitty litter buckets is I they cost about $1.50 and they're actually great. They become, they can double as a table or a chair you can use them as you can use the lids as cutting boards if you're desperate. And again, no one wants to steal anything from you because they're like nothing in that kitty litter bag is worth my time. <laughs> so and then on the outside, I, I put some I made these these little po outside pockets by visiting a thrift store and finding like a server apron with lots of pockets already sewn together. And because I have all this stuff on my bike, I have a lot of freedom. The route that I showed you it was not, it was a very tentative route. I did not know where I was gonna stay. When I left Mexico, I only had the vaguest idea of where I was headed. I was like, I know I'm headed to Canada and the details kind of worked themselves out as I went. And then from day to day, my goal was to get about 60 miles headed towards the next, the next place that I, I knew I had an invitation to stay the night or present at a school or whatever. And I would just go. And when I got tired, I'd sleep. And that's actually one of my, my favorite things about this type of bike touring is I get to eat when I'm hungry. I have about, usually have about a day's worth of food in my pannier at any time. This is a picture of me cooking. I'll, I'll be honest with you. This was my first long solo trip. When I was with friends, we would often make it a big, a big production dinner. We'd all sit together and we'd talk and relax and, and cook. But when I was by myself, it was like, how about I just eat a sandwich so I can go to bed? So I ate a lot of sandwiches. The good news is I had a lot of sandwiches, but a lot of people 
invited me into their house. And so I, ha I was, my meals were supplemented so often by wonderful cooks. So on my bike, it was pretty simple. But the other great thing about biking is I can stop when I want. So I can stop for whatever random thing draws my curiosity, uh, whether it's the statues of dinosaurs in a state park in Texas or the little Indian paintbrush flowers underfoot there. And it's, it's just so much about discovering the world is about slowing down. You're not gonna see a monarch caterpillar going 60 miles down the highway. 10 miles an hour on a bike is a lot, is a lot more, is a, is a lot more opportunity to, to spot things and, and it's a lot easier to stop. When you're in a car, this happens to me all the time, I'll see something interesting and I'll be like, ooh, what was that? But by the time it's like, oh, if I pull over, I gotta find a safe spot, then it's like two miles down the road and then I've gotta find a way to turn around and that's too hard and I'll just keep going. On a bike, you just brake and dump your bike on the ground and then go wander off. And in fact, in Texas, I did that and I was crawling around in a ditch and I look up and there's a cop car and the cop ha is, has been summoned because people were calling, calling for help because they thought I had crashed. So, you know, yeah, I was, I didn't crash. I like got up and I like kind of moved, moved about and was like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm looking for caterpillars. And he was like, uh, what? And then he just drove off. <laughs> And then the last thing I already mentioned, but with bike touring, you don't have to have a solid plan. You just camp when you're tired. And I love this. There's my tent in the picture right behind this tree and there's the road. And I never paid to camp on my trip. And I always found a camping spot and it wasn't always easy. And in fact, because it wasn't always easy, I really felt like I understood the experience of a monarch on this really deep level. And, and so I think of, I would think about the monarchs and that I was seeing on the road and I would think, where are you gonna camp tonight? Cause I don't see a spot to camp cause it's all pavement or cities or cornfields. And so I, th I think like the monarch, I would have these nights where everything was perfect. Like I find the perfect spot, which to me perfect was a flat spot that was out of view and had like a tree to lean my bike up against. And the for the monarchs, the perfect spot is a place that has shelter, so like a tree or, or some vegetation, has some nectar plants to, to eat, and has some milkweed to lay their eggs. And so there were nights where both of us, where it was perfect, where we found exactly what we needed. And there were nights where probably, I, I know I had to bike an hour or two longer than I wanted, and I'm sure the monarchs have had the same experiences of just not finding the place. And so I really think that my bike can help bring a little bit of empathy to the monarch migration and to imagine what can we do so that these travelers don't have to stress what can we do so that they can have a place and a safe place to stay every single night okay so i get to this part in the presentation and people are like i don't want to camp on the side of the road that sounds terrible but here is two reasons why it's not as bad as you think one super easy to clean your house i never clean my house every day except for when i'm camping and two, you meet so many amazing people. This was a, in Mexico, this particular person, or this man stopped me on a long highway. I mean, it just like, it was like one of those highways that looked like it went on forever. And it was so hot. It was at least, at least 100 degrees out. And it was just, you know, you're just a little bit of a slog. You just have your head down. And you're just trying to get somewhere. And I see him kind of get closer and slow down. I'm like, oh boy, what does this guy want? And then he's like, hey, do you want some ice cream? And of course I was like, yeah, of course, please. And that's actually one of my rules is I try, as, as long as I feel safe, I always try to say yes. Say yes to any opportunity along the way. And this wasn't always easy. Like sometimes I was just cranky and not, not a super friendly person. I just, ah, I don't wanna talk to you. But I really did. In fact, I wrote in my handlebar bag, like be nice for the monarchs. And so when people would stop me, I would like take a deep breath and they always, like it always turned out to be something wonderful, like someone wanting to help me with ice cream or, or whatnot. So I really did try and say yes as often as possible. And it wasn't just ice cream. I stayed with 68 families on my trip, which still kind of blows my mind. And most of them were strangers to start. In fact, a few times I stayed with people and I never met them at all. Like they had a house, but they were on vacation and they told me where the, the key was hidden and I'd show up to this address and I'd find the key and I'd make myself at home and I'd spend a few nights and then I'd lock the door when I'd left and rehide the key and that was that. 
And that sort of generosity is, is really incredible. And the, the other thing that I noticed besides that there's a lot of generous people out there was that again, I had a, sim a similar experience with the monarch. So I'm biking around and I'm finding these wonderful people to help feed me and give me shelter. And then I started to notice the same people that are feeding me were also feeding the monarch. And this, this picture here, I think sums it up so perfectly. In the foreground, that's me and Margaret. Margaret is a dairy farmer and she invited me to stay at her farm. And of course I said, yes. And then she, she was like, hey, do you want some homemade ice cream, chocolate ice cream from my dairy cows? And I said, duh, yes. And so I'm eating ice cream in her, with Margaret. And then in the background, she is feeding pollinators. She's feeding the monarchs, she's feeding the bees and the, all the animals that rely on, on those insects. So the people that were helping me were helping the monarchs and the people that the monarchs are most grateful for, I, I too am, am really grateful for. And it's really important because the people, or excuse me, people like Mon uh, Margaret that are, are feeding the monarchs, well, they've got a big task at hand because the monarch population has seen some serious declines. And I'm gonna talk about the Eastern monarchs and the Western monarchs right now. This is the, a graph of the population of the Eastern monarchs. So these are the monarchs that primarily overwinter in, in Mexico. And in fact, that's where they're counted. So, so scientists don't go there and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because they'd go, they'd go mad. Instead, they count the area of land occupied by monarchs. And the specifics aren't important. What's important to note is that there is this downward trend. So you'll see that the population is going up and down. That's totally natural. It's totally normal for all wildlife populations. But if you kind of squint, you'll see that the, there's a downward trend line. And that downward line is dangerous because down is pointing to zero and zero marks extinction. And not monarchs as a species, but of this migration, of the Eastern migration. And the same goes with the Western migration. Oops, sorry, never mind. That did not get in. The Western migration, sorry, looks about exactly the same. It is, well, except for it's probably a steeper decline. And, and the population has gone from millions in the 80s to the, this year's Eastern or Western counts were less than 2000. And there's a lot of reasons for both of these. The main reason, uh, for the eastern monarchs is habitat loss and the west the western monarchs is habitat loss and i also believe climate change to be a, a little bit more influential factor right now for the western monarchs and that's because the overwintering ground the the monarchs are they overwinter when a temperature gets low but as climate change is increasing these winter temperatures it's bringing them out of their overwintering rest and it's making them um, sexually active all year round. So they're breeding constantly. And so if we have, we're not going to see a loss of, of Western monarchs. There's still a lot of monarchs being sighted in California, especially, but they're breeding all year round. They're not congregating in the trees. They're, they're not coming together to overwinter. And so that also means that we're not going to see them as, as into Iowa or Iowa, Ohio, or sorry, Idaho, <laughs> too many states sound the same, Idaho, or Washington, they're not going to be migrating as far. They're going to be staying more resident. So there's a lot of complicated things going on and it can get kind of, it can be a bummer. It can be really, really depressing. Kind of like Michael said, there's just moments where I just want to scream and I just want to like, ah, I get so angry. And then there's moments where it's like, it's not over. You know, we, we haven't lost this fight yet. We're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep doing our best. And we are going to be able to tell the next the generations to come that we tried and that's the most important thing is because there was a time where there were millions of monarchs or, or billions of monarchs and people oh my gosh on my trip every day people would say when i was a kid we used to see lots of monarchs and now we hardly see any i heard that every day and boy how did that make me angry because it was like oh you got to see this great thing like what are you doing so that i get to see it what are you doing so that my friend's kid that was born three weeks ago gets to see this like we have a responsibility and boy I'm already feeling like my heart rate's going up it's like we have got to do something about this we have got to try and as long as people are trying then I I find it a lot easier to keep moving forward and so everyone has a part to play every single person if I went back to that first range math you can see that every single person can help the monarch 
And by helping the monarch, you are helping so much more. You're helping so many other creatures. And I, I have found it that my way is to be their voice, is to talk on behalf of the monarchs because monarchs, they can't call representatives and fight for, to protect their habitat. They can't plant gardens. They, they can't run for city council, but, but you and I, we can. We can be their voice and we can, we can help, help the monarch by, by speaking on their behalf. And so that's what I did on my trip. I kind of consider my bicycle tour a publicity stunt of sorts. I said, hey, look, I'm over here. This is fun, this is exciting. And people would be like, oh, what are you doing? And I'd just start talking about monarchs and telling people the same thing every single time. Plant native plants and plant milkweed over and over again. I have said those two things a million times, I bet. And it's, it's so great because it's so simple and it's so easy. All we have to do is return the planet to native. All we need to do is plant those native plants. And I have said this thousands of times. I presented to, um, oh, I want to say almost 50 schools and about 35 nature centers, about 9,000 people in total with formal presentations and, and thousands more. And, and I'm so happy that I have this book now because it's really just elevating my voice and, and helping me reach so many more people. And, and it was so important to me because as I said, I would get angry like there would be times first of all where it would be perfect it would be so amazing i'd be biking down the road and it would just there'd be a tailwind and some sunshine and there'd be along the road all these natives like in this picture here's a, a common milkweed out east common milkweed is my favorite milkweed um, it's really common hence the name and it has these beautiful purple clusters of shooting star like flowers and they smell amazing and I like the common milkweed was really spread out across the eastern bit of my range, pretty much north of Texas, north or north of Texas. And it kind of started to feel like a friend. Every time I'd see common milkweed, I'd be like, oh, hey, buddy. And then, of course, here's a fifth instar caterpillar. So fifth instar is the largest caterpillar stage. And, and soon this caterpillar will crawl off the milkweed and form its chrysalis and then and then emerge as a as a adult monarch. And this is a stage photo. I found this monarch biking at 10 miles an hour down the road. And I slammed on my brakes, jumped my bike and spent like an hour in the ditch discovering all the other little neighbors hidden in there. And then afterwards I was like, oh, this is a great photo. So I set it up and so you can see here, I'm like about ready to jump off my bike. That is very much what happened pretty much every time. I was always looking for an excuse to stop. So there would be just this, I would just like completely lose myself in this little tiny postage stamp of land. I, I could just spend an hour, two hours just in this one little spot. And then I'd look at my map and be like, oh boy, I better get going. And then of course, a few miles later, you'd see this. And it is a blessing and a curse to fall in love with a creature like the monarch because they're so wonderful and they've just brought so much joy and opportunity to my life. But at the same time, they've, they've, given me these this new this new these new eyes to see the world through their perspective and to see the roadside ditches in this whole new light and so I saw this ditch or I saw this man mowing this lawn and like my heart just broke and I don't think anyone could understand why I was so upset but like the caterpillars that were just mowed down those were my friends those are my traveling companions and they had gotten so far by now this is Iowa and no, Idaho, Indiana. Oh my gosh, I did it again. <laughs> Indiana. So they were. It, it was the fall, and so it was like three generations had survived to to lay their eggs in this ditch, and then this mower just went by, and boy, oh, it was just really depressing. And it never ended. Everywhere I went, there was green grass lawns, green grass, green grass, green grass, and and I. Ooh. What I want to say is that I know that the people in these that that have these green grass lawns are trying to be good neighbors. And they're they're good people and they they care about the planet, they care about their their neighbors of all of the but but they don't have quite they don't they don't know who their neighbors are, I guess I could say. And what we need to do is we need to stop thinking just about our human neighbors and think about the birds that live in our backyard and the bees that live in our backyard and the frogs and the snakes and the salamanders and the skunks. And we need to think about all of our neighbors and we need to learn to share. So we can do this, we can share. We can have some green grass lawn and we can return other parts to natives. We can have our cornfields 
And if we don't spray, milkweed can grow up alongside them. We can have our a little a little lawn in the suburbs so that our dog can run around and our kids can play. And then we can also share and we have to learn to share. And so, like I said, I, I could get a little upset and then I would find medicine. And this was just it's so important to me to meet folks that were being part of the solution. And I want to tell you about a few of them because they can be medicine for you as well. This is some school kids in Omaha. I got the, the, the name right this time, Omaha, Nebraska. And the teacher had turned this little bit of grassy, a, a steep grassy slope near the parking lot into this butterfly garden. And there was milkweed and we found eggs and we found caterpillars. And I will never forget that moment when a monarch flew over our heads and we just all shouted with joy. And that monarch would not have been there without those kids in that garden. And what I love is that monarch navigated just like cement and or concrete, concrete and and pavement and green grass and all of this suburban Omaha landscape to find this garden. And if you build your garden, they will come. More medicine was meeting folks like Bill. He's a farmer in Texas and he started his career as a landscaper planting Bermuda grass. And then one day he was like, what am I doing? I live in Texas. Like, it doesn't rain here in the summer, not enough to have this Bermuda grass lawn. Like, I need to do things different. And so he started planting natives and that turned into his family farm called Native American Seed. And they actually plant natives and then gather the seeds and sell those seeds to people that want to replant Texas. And I stayed with them twice and it was just so lovely and wonderful and really inspiring to, to meet to meet Bill and his family. And then there's Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I love this picture because it's such a great example of sharing. We have the green grass in the background, we have the patio, and then we have the garden. And it's a mix of natives and non-native plants, including common milkweed. And it's like a small garden, right? You're like, well, what does that really do? Well, that little bit of milkweed, Amy had said that there, she'd already found 40 eggs on her milkweed by the time I got there. And if just one of those eggs survives to become an adult, that's 500 more eggs in the next generation. And if one of, or if 1% 1 of those eggs survive, or even if just a few of those eggs survive, well, that's thousands more eggs in the next generation. And I often would think when I'd see a monarch flying by, it'd be like, wow, are you related to one of those eggs I saw in Amy's garden? And it really, it really made me think about all of the connections we make how we might not ever see our friend's garden or see a stranger's garden in another state or another town or across the street in their backyard. We might never see that garden, but we might very well see the monarch that was poss made possible because of that garden. And speaking of front yards and backyards, this was Nadia's garden. I love this garden. I love this photo. She had native plants in the front yard and the backyard. And I think this is so critical. Often people put their, their natives in the back corner like they're embarrassed by them, but we need to put them in the front yards. We need to celebrate them and we need our neighbors to be able to see our example. And so I love this photo because you can see easily where the property line is, right? But then you can see there's some more milkweed, this a little bit of this brave trespassing milkweed right here. And I asked Nadia about it and she said, oh, well, when our neighbors learned that if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs, they started mowing around this milkweed. And I've just thought, how beautiful is that? Not only will the natives spread when we give them the space, not only will they do the hard work of growing where we need them to grow, but all, that's just the same exact way our ideas are spreading. So it's, it's house by house, it's from neighbor to neighbor, it's from dinner table to dinner table, like, and I, and I love it because I can't talk to everyone and you can't talk to everyone, but, but if we all talk to a few people, it ripples out. And if we all plant a small garden and be that example, it ripples out. And, and nothing tells this better, nothing proves this more, I think, than the monarch. And in, this is a picture from Mitch Wakan, and this is in the early spring, probably early March. And this is when the monarchs are really flying around all the time, and I'm sure, you folks in California may have seen this in winters past as well. And when the sun hits a colony, it warms them up and then they explode into the sky in unison. And I have spent four winters now in Mexico and I have spent, I don't know, I, I, would, I would say three or four hours of my life 
in under this phenomenon, under these flying monarchs with my eyes closed because I just love more than anything else the sound of millions of monarchs. And so to go back to talking, to go back to being a voice, one monarch in a forest would be impossible for me to hear, just as my voice alone would be impossible to hear. But millions of monarchs, they create this beautiful hum and all of us talking and, and being part of the solution that it just, it, it, it will add up to something that's impossible to ignore. And if I could bullet, or if I could continue this metaphor one more moment, because I just love this metaphor, it, it inspires me, the monarchs inspire me with this. Here is what the monarchs look like when they are hanging from the clusters in the winter. And they spend the winter like this to conserve their fat reserves. And you'll see here, there's thousands of monarchs on every branch. And it takes four monarchs to equal the weight of a dime. But sometimes the, the so many monarchs will be on a branch that it will bend the branch or even break the branch under their weight. And so here, this is a small tree right here, but none, nonetheless, it is a tree that is being bent by monarch butterflies. And I think, I think, wow, okay, one butterfly would barely move an, uh, a needle on a pine tree, but here they're bending trees and it's the same with us. One person, one garden, it's just the garden, but all of us, we could metaphorically bend branches if we just all work together, if we just all do a little bit. And so, what I love is it doesn't matter where you live. You, you can live, oh, I saw monarchs everywhere. And this monarch I saw in New York City. And so I love this, this picture because I took probably like, I don't even know, 300 pictures of this monarch. I was thrilled. I like, I'd been biking through New York City, I'm just like almost daydreaming. Wow, wouldn't it be amazing if I saw a monarch here? And then of course I saw one. So while all the other tourists are taking pictures of like whatever they take pictures of buildings, I am running around taking pictures of this, this male monarch. And I was just, it was, it was so wonderful. It was a, a perfect end to my stay in New York City. Um, I, I also saw, by the way, I saw caterpillars and queens and eggs in, in Brooklyn. So I, not only did I see caterpillars, but I know that they're, they're home there, or monarchs. I saw that they're home there. They'll make their home wherever someone grows the garden. And, and I, well, I could just go on and on about how much I, I love the monarchs and how grateful I am for them. And I think the monarchs, every time we grow a garden, we are thanking the monarchs for their beauty. We're thanking them for being here. And then they turn around and they thank us. And I wanna talk about, just to wrap things up, I wanna talk about one of my, my favorite gifts that the monarch gives us. And I, I believe that the, the gift of the monarch, when people ask why save the monarchs, I don't believe the most important thing is because they are ecologically significant or because without them we'll all die. Like, for me, the most important thing is that monarchs are guides. Monarchs guide us into nature. And here is what I'm talking about. So here's a beautiful monarch on some beautiful milkweed. And it is impossible not to love them, right? You look at that monarch and you're like, that's a good looking animal, <laughs> super beautiful. And, and so people fall in love with the monarch. I actually call them gateway bugs. And then they're, the monarch is kind of like, come on, come into nature with me. It's not so scary. Look, I'm a beautiful butterfly. And so they'll, they'll kind of hold your hand as you're like, I want to find caterpillars. So you'll get down on your knees and you'll start looking for caterpillars. And lo and behold, though, you'll find. looking for monarch caterpillars this white milky latex is this white latex sap that's it's a it's a glue that will glue shut the mouths of young caterpillars and prevent er herbivores oops my internet is unstable so am i um and sorry if there's any any glitches here but we'll keep moving along but that is the the sap is also toxic and so the monarch caterpillar, as it's eating the milkweed, is actually gaining toxic protection by, by eating the plant. Okay, and, and so you're looking for the caterpillars, and of course, then you start to find all the other animals at home in the milkweed. You'll find the tussock moths. I call these like 70s shag carpet, and they also eat milkweed. They rely on milkweed. Then you'll start to see the googly-eyed spiders that I don't know if this particular species eats monarch eggs, but I imagine it does. So monarchs will lay about 500 eggs, only about between one and kind of depends on the numbers of what people say, but less than probably around 5% survive. So 
So 500 eggs, that's five caterpillar or five adults. That means they're providing lots and lots of food for other animals. Um, and you'll find them as you as you wander about. And then the monarchs will help you see and spot all the other pollinators. This is a hummingbird moth. It blew my mind the first time I saw one. And you might even find a frog. And I am a, a frog researcher. I spend my summers counting tadpoles. This summer I'll be in the Sierra for the for the third year counting tadpoles in the high country. And this is a little tree frog seeking refuge in a milkweed leaf. And so if I had tried to follow monarchs on a bike, I, it would have been a very short trip, or excuse me, if I had tried to follow frogs on a bike, it would have been a very short trip. So I chose the monarchs for a lot of reasons, but one is that they have this great migration that, that goes to a lot of places and it's easily accessible by bike. And, and as I'm helping the monarchs, I am definitely helping the frogs. And if I'm help, when I'm helping the frogs, I'm helping the monarchs. It's, it's really, everything is connected. And the monarch helps us see this. It helps us see this world. It helps us remind us that when we protect milkweed, we are protecting so much more. And so you don't have to bike through Mexico. You can if you want. This is in the desert of Mexico. It was a wonderful day until I got stabbed by one of these yuccas. Um, I, I really don't recommend it. My arm hurt for like a, um, probably a month. And I, it was only because I wasn't paying attention and I leaned into one. But you don't have to get stabbed by yuccas in Mexico or navigate New York City. I went to the wrong apartment in New York City. Like I made it up the elevator to the 32nd floor of my friend's apartment only to realize that I had gone to the wrong apartment. So I can navigate to Mexico, but I can't find the right apartment in New York City. And you don't have to tackle or brave the wild animals of, of Canada. Uh, by the way, the, the skunk and I both escaped un, unscathed. Uh, we both ran like cowards. And all you have to do to have an adventure with the monarchs is plant milkweed. And I guarantee you, if you plant milkweed, if you plant native nectar plants in your yard, the true adventurers will come to you. And I, I, I really believe that the true monarchs, or the true adventurers of the monarchs, they should get the credit. They don't need, they don't need anything. They just need us to plant milkweed. They don't need gas stations and phones. All they need is us to plant milkweed. So I um, hope folks can can learn more by reading my book. Um, if you have questions for me, my website is beyondabook.org. And I want to I want to finish up with just reading two bar paragraphs from my book. And it's the two paragraphs of the acknowledgement section. I fought so hard to have a long acknowledgement section in my book. Like I fought really hard for this. And I want to end this with the last two chapters, or the last, the last two paragraphs. Thanks to everyone fighting in endlessly big and small ways on behalf of the monarchs and their neighbors. Our paths may not have crossed, but your efforts are seen, felt, and appreciated. Biking past an unmowed ditch or a lawn devoted to natives will always make me hoot with joy. And finally, with all my heart and soul, thanks to the monarchs. You amaze me. You have become my teachers, encouraging an adventure, teaching me Spanish, watercolor, web design, video editing, photography, networking, public speaking, gardening, stewardship, science, and love. You helped me write this book, and every word of it is for you. And I truly believe that I, this book would not have happened without the monarchs. Would not have, my bike ride wouldn't happen without the monarchs, and I'm this presentation wouldn't have happened without the monarchs mm -hmm. and Chaucer's books. So. I'm going to reconfigure my screen, and if folks have questions, okay. we can finish up with that. Before we begin with the audience questions, Sarah, I've, I had a couple questions for you. Um, I don't know, and I was wondering, from your experience, you had you came across tons of generous people, a few creeps, came across some social differences, political differences with people. What sense did you get a to? Did, did you get a sense that it made you more optimistic or more cynical for the future of monarchs by interacting with these people? I would have to say more, more hopeful. People, once they know, people want to help. So most of the time, people grew up with, you know, with their parents telling them pull out the milkweed or mow the lawn. It looks bad. It looks weedy. We, mm -hmm. we have a, we have the mm -hmm. word weedy in our vocabulary, yeah. which means bad. And as soon as we learn that weeds are not bad and that milkweed in fact is the most important plant to the monarchs it changes how we see the world and then and then we start mowing around the milkweed and i really think it just takes it takes people reminding us of 
of other creatures and giving people that perspective. And I think with that perspective, people, people want to help. Mm, that's great. It's alarming that the Western monarchs are not going as far as Idaho because that's, as when I was younger, that's what I always was told that they would migrate from California to the overwintering sites and go to art to Idaho. But now you say they're more residential, meaning that means they're not going to migrate. Is that what yeah, the they're, future they're is? Yeah, they're breeding year round, exactly. So there's no, they're, they're not. They're not going into sexual diapause and they're not clinging from the trees and overwintering like they used to. Instead, they're finding milkweed all year round and they're finding warm temperatures all year round. And so they're just continuously going through that cycle of, of breeding, dying, eggs popping up. And so that means why, mm -hmm. why would you fly to Iowa? Or I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> why would you fly anywhere? I'm going to stop trying to say state names. I have actually biked to every single state in the United States, and I do know where every state is. I just can't, I can't <laughs> say them. <laughs> but it's okay. But yeah, it's and it's all still all the information is still coming out, so it's all relatively new, right? And scientists are still trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure out why and what's happening. But, but um, yeah, time will tell. Okay, I have one more question, then we'll get to the audience. Um, I want people to buy the book, and I don't want you to reveal a lot, but. What fast, they're fascinating creatures. And what fascinated me the most is toward the end, you wrote about how they depart with a degree of the sun is a 57 degrees, 57 degrees in the air, but then they arrive at Mexico with the sun 57 degrees in the air. If you could talk a little bit about that. It's mind blowing. And so I put a lot of science in this book. And I think sometimes, you know, people are like, ah, science. But for me, the, the important part is, is to remember not the specific. So not you don't need to necessarily remember the exact degrees. And mm -hmm. I might even mess it up if I tried to say it now. But more that there's this connection between the angle of the sun and the monarchs. And, and basically what happens is the monarchs that are further north, they have to start migrating way sooner than monarchs further south. So monarchs in Minnesota, mm -hmm. they have to start leaving for Mexico much earlier than monarchs in Oklahoma. And mm. so scientists are like, how do they figure that out? And basically what they figured out is that every day, right, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And we, we call that the point where it's the highest in the sky, solar noon. And the angle at solar mm -hmm. noon, there's, there's an angle where it's like the start of the migration. So when, the, when, the, when that angle is at a certain part in the sky in that part of Minnesota, right? Cause it's different as in different mm -hmm. parts of the latitude, mm -hmm. then that, that pretty much sets the, the, the start of the migration. And then as you go wow. further south, they have to wait another few, you know, a few more days until the sun is at that same angle. And then when it does, those monarchs start going. And then when, by the time you get to Texas, well, it's much later in, in the fall and the sun will reach that angle. And then those monarchs will start migrating and they'll do that all the way. And then they arrive and it's, it's just like, there's just so many of these like little tiny details and you learn about them and you're just like, wait, how is that possible? It's yeah. so wonderful. And the monarch wow. is one of the most studied insects in the world. And so we have all these great we have so much knowledge of them. And then there's just so much we don't know. We, we don't actually know if it has anything to do with the sun or if the sun is triggering something else that the monarchs are queuing in on. We don't, we don't know. We just know there's some link there and, and we don't know how those links will change with climate change. We don't know as we tweak things, what that means, but it means something and stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, a uh, viewer wanted to know, how'd you get in shape for riding 60 miles a day? You don't get in shape. Wow. Like, you just start in the first few days, you just are in a lot of pain. <laughs> Your butt hurts a lot. And mm -hmm. you're just like, oh, why did I agree to do this? This is terrible. And then you get used <laughs> to it. And you don't start by, you don't, you don't start out with 70 mile days. You start out a little, a little less and you kind of are forgiving on yourself and you stop, stop sooner in the day. But like I would be in Mexico, boy, my, my average speed in Mexico, I was on a lot of steep dirt roads was, I, I think one day my average speed was six miles an hour, which is like a little fat, you know, it's twice wow. as fast as walking. And, but then, so I was, I was in the saddle for, for way too many hours, but, but 
you don't actually like so if in order to train i would you'd have to bike for 10 hours a day and so like why would you do that you just start and yeah get in shape as you go mm -hmm. i'm not in shape right now <laughs> <laughs> how many how many flat tires did you have i only have four flat tires i buy pretty beefy wow. beefy tires they they usually last about 15,000 miles so i started I, I started on a pair and then the, the rear wheel, because it's a lot heavier, because it has all my stuff and me, it wears out sooner. So usually when I start to see that it's really wearing out, I'll put the rear wheel on the front wheel and I'll switch them and then I'll give them a lot more life. And people oh. always look at my wheels and they, they kind of feel sorry for me and they, they're like, oh no, but the, the wheels, they <laughs> last a long time. And my rule is when I start getting a flat tire every week, I, I get a new pair, but I think I'm still on the same ones that I was. No, I couldn't be. That was my trip was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was a while ago. Never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so T wanted to. I love the book, and you mentioned ice cream a few times. <laughs> How much ice cream do you think you consumed on this trip? <laughs> oh, not enough. <laughs> no, I ate a lot. It kind of became a joke in my book, and in fact, I, it became a joke in my presentation. So I did a lot of presentations and. I'll never forget, I think I write about this in the book, in Southern Ontario, after a presentation, the, you know, the people had learned that I love ice cream because I talked so much about ice cream. And I, I'm, you know, I'm talking to people at the end of the presentation, I turn around and these women are like, we found you ice cream. And they had like <laughs> gone out after my presentation, like found some ice cream and brought it back to me. And I, I, I wrote in the book, in southern Ontario, I was biking between presentations simply so that I could be hungry to eat more ice cream because mm -hmm. people really rolled out the red carpet of ice cream. <laughs> so you camp most of the days with the exception of visiting friends. And then somebody wanted to know for camping, did you seek out the spots where butterflies migrate to? How did you, you know, locate your sites and whatnot? I did not. Sometimes I would camp with a butterfly. Like I'll, I camped at this, at this like it was like a really weedy section outside of a cemetery, but in the, it was really rural. I mean, the cemetery, no one must have stepped in there, and for I don't know, 15 years. And mm -hmm. but I found the spot that felt like okay, I'm not going to be like insulting anyone. It was quite. It was maybe a couple, I don't know, 400 yards away from yeah. the fence line, and. Then I look up and there's a little monarch in the tree. And in fact, that was the night I thought, wow, what if instead of cemeteries that were just nothing but green grass, everyone planted native flowers for around their loved one's graves. And so all mm -hmm. it would just be full of butterflies and beauty. Yeah. And in fact, for a lot of folks, the monarchs represent the souls of loved ones. So how beautiful yeah. would it be if you were visiting the grave of, of someone you loved or love and a monarch came? It would oh, it'd bring tears to my eyes every time. Mm -hmm. By the way, but mostly the mo oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was ahead. just gonna say, mo most of the time the monarchs just spread out, and it was it was nothing but luck that our paws would cross, and sometimes it was at night, and all, most of the time it wasn't. But for me, the most important part wasn't actually seeing monarchs all the time; it was seeing people that could help the monarch. Mm. By the way, you write really beautifully about the spirit and you know, the grays and everything. I'm not telling anybody, they have to buy the book and read it, but it's, <laughs> that was one of my favorite chapters in the book. Thank um, you. Kat, sure. Kat, Kathy wanted to know that that photo that you took of, of you riding by the caterpillar, who took <laughs> that photo? And who I took the photos of you? She wanted to know. Yeah. I carried a tripod and I occupied many hours of my life trying to create get a photo of me and a monarch in a in a in my bike i oh there was this one day where there was like so much common milkweed and there was this was in ontario and there was probably 50 monarchs on it and i was like this is the day i'm gonna get a monarch some milkweed in my bike and i set up <laughs> my tripod and i had it all ready and i had a little clicker so i could plug into my camera a little a little remote so i wouldn't have to like set up a timer and run out there. I could set it all up, have my clicker in my hand. So if you look at my picture, I'm almost always holding a little clicker. And then yeah. I'd bike by and I'd be like looking at the corner of my eye, where's the tripod and click, 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 click. And that was the day that my clicker ran out of battery. 
Oh, I was so oh. mad because it would have been a great photo, but I, I <laughs> used a tripod a lot. Kathy said the photos were very good, by the way. She added that Thank in you. here. Um, <laughs> it was Ruby fun. wants to know. Okay. <laughs> Ruby wants to know what is the trigger that causes the caterpillar to leave the milkweed plant to create the chrysalis? Is it a hormonal trigger or something else? That's a good question. So I believe it is. I don't want to mess this up. I don't even think I, I don't think I put this in my, my book. If, if someone knows, they can put it in the question and answer. The, the monarchs, so they, the, the caterpillar goes through five instars. And so they emerge from their egg and they usually eat the eggshell and then they'll keep eating and then they'll get too big for their exoskeleton and they'll molt and then they'll do that. And then when they're a fifth instar, it might be that they've, they're too, they've outgrown their exoskeleton. And so they know it's time to molt uh -huh. and that last molt is them becoming their chrysalis. So you'll actually watch them um, the, leave, leave their, the, the last, yeah. the, their last exoskeleton behind to be the chrysalis. And so I don't wanna say the wrong, wrong thing. I'm still, there's still so much to learn, um, mm -hmm. but I would guess it was just the, the, the confines of their exoskeleton. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see you go from a green chrysalis and then right at the end, it's clear. And I think when my wife and I saw our first one and we just freaked out and it's like, what the heck? And you actually see the monarch in the chrysalis and you're just amazed. It's such an amazing, it's miraculous. Yeah. If you didn't see that, like and someone told you that a caterpillar became a butterfly, like you'd be like, no way, no, no, no. You have to sort of see that thing kind of to believe it. Yeah, yeah. You had mentioned um, common milkweed, and here I'm sure it's probably uh, California milkweed to get for butterflies, caterpillars. But often people get tropical milkweed, which is not a good thing because it's a non native plant. And if you could briefly say, why is it bad to get used tropical milkweed as opposed to native milkweed? for caterpillars and monarchs. Yeah, there's a complicated balance between all things in nature. And so when you take, when you change the equation and introduce a non-native species, that balance really shifts and can often not be good for all the other species involved. And, and so the, the dilemma with tropical milkweed is that it, it doesn't die back in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, it will, it'll last longer because it's, it, uh, the other uh, most other milkweeds they they mm -hmm. will die back and then in the spring they'll reemerge as perennials and and so the the tropical milkweed doesn't do this in the same way and so what happens is that there's this protozoan parasite um, called well, the short the short name is OE and it's spread by spores and so if a monarch affected with OE in a, a, mm -hmm. a light amount can survive and it will have these spores on them and it will, it will shed, the, shed their scales with the spores and then the caterpillars will eat those and then they'll get a load of OE. And if they get too much, if they eat too much of the spores, if they get too big of a load, they'll die. And if, they, if it's mm. a small amount, then they'll be infected and they'll help spread it. And so if uh, in the, what, what, what normally happens is the native plants will die back and that'll kind of reset the, the spore loads and to zero so that the new growth will be OE free, which will give the caterpillars the healthiest place to, to eat. So if that can't happen, then what happens is you just get more and more and more and more OE, which creates more uh, and more and more contaminated monarchs, which spread it to more and more and more places. And it just kind of builds out and, and, and becomes a bigger and bigger problem. So tropical milkweed, unfortunately, is really accessible. Lots of places sell it and it's really easy to grow and propagate. But the, the best thing to do is, is to look for native species and the Xerces Society, if you type in Xerces mm -hmm. uh, milk finder yeah. or milkweed finder, you can mm -hmm. find spots. And there's a lot of really cool species in California that are California native that um, are, I, I enjoy seeing them. And um, yeah, so there's, okay. there's options be, beyond tropical milkweed.
Okay, so Nancy, I hope that answered your question as well. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add as, as we close up here, Sarah? Just a closing thought you wanted to leave people with? Well, I'm just so grateful for everyone tuning in and for being part of the solution. And, and I, I just am amazed and grateful every day, like for the opportunity the Monarch has given me. It's like, I'm like looking at your computer screen and, and seeing my book in your corner. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I wrote a book. <laughs> and I, I truly like give all the credit to the Monarch. Like the Monarch made this possible. And I, I hope that I can, I can do the Monarch justice and I can continue to, to help the Monarch because they are certainly helping me. And, and so people tuning in tonight, that's, that's really helping, helping me do, you know, fulfill my, my, my part of this. And, and so, yeah, I'm just really grateful and happy. I think if the monarchs could speak, Sarah, they say, you done good, Sarah. No, they'd be like, you are slow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I always say I'm slower than a butterfly, but faster than a caterpillar. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you didn't have one fly between the spokes of your bike when you're well, trying to Well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I love that story, and that did not happen. <laughs> but you're much faster than I. Well, Seth, thank you for joining us in Chaucer's book. Yes, thank book. you. Everyone, thank you, and please buy Bicycling with Butterflies. It truly is a wonderful book, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.